California, about 60 miles north of Sacramento. I'm Steve Fox. In just a couple of minutes, we're all going to get on board this Western Pacific freight train, which left Oakland in the middle of the night, and take a ride up the Feather River Canyon through the Sierras. I'm told it's going to be a beautiful trip. We may run into some snow in the higher passes. Along the way today, we're going to find out something about modern railroading and railroad men. Plus, we'll find out why passenger trains are dying while freight trains, like this one, flourish. Engineer Ralph Diggs at the controls takes his train carefully up the canyon, sometimes creeping along at about 15 miles an hour. It's only a 1% grade, not steep at all, but bad weather can produce danger and it takes at least 300 feet to stop all this mass. Five engines, 55 cars, more than a mile long. What kind of problems can you run into on this route? What do you have to be on the lookout for? Well, in this kind of weather, the main thing is rocks. Uh, rocks come down and derail trains and, uh, well, it just cause problems that way. To shortstop problems, Western Pacific is kind of an advance man for its trains. A four-wheel drive Bronco Jeep, mounted on the rails, runs two miles ahead of the freight, looking for slides or washouts. Western Pacific also has special slide fences in place, designed not to hold back earth, but rather to signal when the earth rips through them. The wires carry electrical charges, which are read back in Western Pacific's dispatch center in Sacramento. Here they keep track of all the trains between San Francisco and Salt Lake City and, by radio, give the orders that keep the freight moving. Fred Tegler, Western Pacific Vice President, on why freights have replaced passenger trains. They don't provide the occupancy of the train throughout the year. We have periodic uses of passenger trains. Those railroads that still run railroad trains, uh, passenger trains but uh, they're not used on a consistent basis. The railroads have been a romantic situation from the time they first started operating in the 1800s, and there's still the romance of operating a, a railroad train, and people still enjoy them. They enjoy the freight trains. But they miss the passenger trains. They miss the passenger trains, but uh, they still don't ride them. Way in the back of the train, behind the 55 flat cars, more than a mile, in fact, from the engine, you find the caboose. Now, railroad romantics would probably be disappointed to see how ordinary it looks back here. Not at all cozy like the popular image or impersonal. In fact, as you notice, you don't even have a pot-bellied wood-burning stove anymore. There's an oil burner. The reason for that is that back in the old days, the engineers and conductors used to be assigned to individual trains, so they would personalize the cabooses. Now, of course, the crews work whatever gear is available. Up in the front engine again, I talked with brakeman Bob Hines. Bob's brother works for Western Pacific too. They followed their father into the company, an old railroad tradition. But Bob says railroad men just aren't what they used to be. Yeah, I think the, the earlier uh, railroaders, it was a, a different job then. It was like, like, like a family to them, a railroad family more or less. Now it's, for most guys, just a job, huh? Yeah, I, I feel that way. It's, it's your livelihood, and it's a way to make a living. Be that as it may, there's still something about the sight and sound of a fast freight traveling somewhere, anywhere, that stirs the romantic in all of us. Old train, I can hear your whistle blow, and I won't be jumping on again. Old train. I've been everywhere you go, and I know what lies beyond each bend. Old train, each time you pass, you're older than the last, and it seems I'm too old for running. I hear your rusty wheels grate against the rails, they cry with every mile. I think I'll stay a while. Old train, I grow up the miles and I'll miss the freedom that was mine. Old train, just to think about those times, I'll smile when you're high on by. Old train, each time you pass, you're older than the last, and it seems I'm too old for running. I hear your rusty wheels fade against the rails, they cry with every mile. 
Portola in the High Sierras, four hours and 110 miles from Oroville. The end of the line for us and the men we rode with, but the freight goes on to Salt Lake City with a whole new crew. Well, sitting with us now is Scott Gibbs, and regular viewers of the evening show may recognize his name as the producer, cameraman on many of our action and adventure <laughs> stories. <laughs> Scott has taken both Jan and I places where we never want to go again <laughs> in our lives. <laughs> now, a couple of weeks ago, in the various news shows and in the newspapers, you might have read about a helicopter crash. That helicopter crash involved Scott, who was the cameraman on the story we just saw, the freight train to the Sierra. Scott was in the <coughs> helicopter, high above the train, shooting the aerials, which you saw in the story, and survived, miraculously, a 30-foot crash by the copter. And he was rolling tape during the crash. We're going to get to that in a minute, but let's walk through it from the beginning. As First I recall, of all, we like you being back. Thank you. I like being back. <laughs> it's better to be back than still out in that pond. We're as I recall, we began by going to a small airport in Reno where we rented the helicopter. I was on the ground, in fact, taking some of those still shots of you getting all bundled up in your... Uh, snowmobile suit. Both the pilot and I wore sn snowmobile suits because we expected the uh, temperatures to be down to about 20 degrees, 25 degrees up in the air and moving at anywhere from 20 to 80 miles an hour with the door off so that we could shoot uh, necessitated wearing some warm clothing. Interestingly, those of us on the crew, those of us who helped Scott get into the helicopter, Steve Chauvin and Cricket Kowalczyk and I, after we talked about it, and even at the time, had a strange feeling about the helicopter. I mean, there was a kind of a sense that something wasn't right. No one wanted to say it out loud. When it wouldn't start. When it wouldn't <laughs> start. That was a good sign. Did you took... have any feelings, Scott? Uh, yes, for just a minute I thought it might be a nice idea to get out, but then I remembered that uh, we needed the aerials, and so I went up and uh, did it anyway. Okay, I now you got up into the air and you headed toward Portola in the Sierras. Mm -hmm. What happened next? Well, we did about an hour and a half's flying time to get roughly 20 minutes of aerials on the first roll of videotape, and we followed the train up through some extremely dangerous and extremely difficult terrain. It's a V-notch canyon, and the train was running along the bottom of it. And we got some extraordinarily nice aerials, given the terrain and the weather. It started to snow just a little bit, um, mixed snow and rain. And toward the end now, the train came into Portola to and the station. And as the train came into Portola, um, we got some shots of it entering Portola. And as it was leaving, the pilot said to me, would you like to get some shots of the uh, caboose, low shots right, running right along next to the train, shots of the caboose, and I said, sure. Being the adventure of sorts? Well, it didn't seem like an adventure at the time. And we went down quite low and ran along parallel to the train, and I was shooting a shot, a tight shot of the caboose when it happened. And, and if you it was what? What happened? As we came in low next to the train, um, I started to zoom in on the caboose and got a clear look at the guy in the caboose and suddenly there was a loud thump and we were going all over the sky. Scott, that happened awfully fast and I don't think I could quite tell what caused it. What caused it was the tail rotor of the helicopter hitting one of three 10,000 volt high tension lines and breaking it. When we lost the tail rotor, the main rotors turning one way started to turn the helicopter body the other way. We spun faster and faster for about five to eight seconds and then with a loud thump hit the water, uh, actually the ice, there was an inch and a half of ice on the water and uh, everything stopped and then we got out quickly. It was the ice and the water that saved your lives. The combination of the ice on the water and just hitting water. Mm -hmm. And the gas tanks didn't break, and therefore we did not burn. But the helicopter was destroyed. T totally. Well, along with the camera. Along with the camera, <laughs> which we are more or less glad about because we get a new camera now, to be honest. <laughs> but I'm glad we don't have to get a, good a new cameraman, another good cameraman. Yes, I mean, Scott definitely. is very good, and it would be a terrible loss to the show and to us personally. Definitely. I would have taken it personally, too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this chance to be a stand-up comic. Yeah. We're glad you're with us, Scott. Thank you. Stay with us, Jan, and I will be right back with a preview of uh, tomorrow's evening magazine. <laughs>